Hello there, I'm Miranda Gretton and this is Take a Moment with NCHC, the show where we talk to you and your colleagues about experiences that affect you. Listen on your drive between patients or in your downtime, whenever you get the chance to take a moment. Hello everyone, my name is Paula, Paula McGreevy. I work for the Community Access Team and I'm a nurse. Hello everyone, I'm Diana. I'm one of the physiotherapists working in Community Access Team and um, I've been here for um, on and off six years. Tell me about the Community Access Team. Tell me about your service. What is it? Who is it for? If you were to deconstruct our team, you would think that there could potentially be two separate teams. But what we have done quite uniquely is amalgamated our teams. We have a front door team, which is based in A&E, which deals with potentially emission avoidance and supporting people who come into hospital via A&E to be on the right pathway. And then we support patients the other end where we discharge patients to our community colleagues in the community beds and we ensure that we facilitate a safe discharge with those. Interesting and that is quite unique isn't it to have those two aspects? Definitely yes yeah I don't know of another acute service that has the two combined in one team. I think it works it definitely works there's there's so many disciplines in our our team to be able to sort of like seek knowledge of each other we're, we're always just drawing on each other's skills because we've got so many different skill sets within the team we compromise we've got physiotherapists we've got occupational therapists assistant practitioners and nursing staff and we've got a lovely admin assistant as well so we've got such a good combination of people to work together to try and make sure that patients are discharged effectively appropriately and you know safely it's all year round isn't it it's it's constant yeah 365 days a year seven days a week yes yeah it's every single day we're here we're ready to take on the challenges of supporting discharging patients and is it just people who come into a and e we do receive direct referrals from community so if somebody is is at home and they've sort of sought out a a GP or a a community matron or a specialist service with the ACPs and the AMPs, if they have gone to somebody's house and find that they're not actually able to manage safely within that home environment, rather than admit them to the acute hospital at that time because they don't need the acute intervention, they can come as a referral via our team. We can let them know where the beds are within the community and we can source and support how they get into that community bed safely, which prevents an acute admission at that time, but also supports them to have their rehab or their um, medical goals that are not needed to be achieved in the acute happen. This must benefit an awful lot of services. The acutes, for one, that you're freeing up beds that potentially don't need to be taken up by somebody who could be elsewhere, but also our services, if you can avoid that admission, as the the name suggests, and you can get them home with a care package, then that's even better as well. So how often do you put somebody home as opposed to the hospital? Would you would, would that always be a preferable route? Yeah. In uh, the emergency department, um, this service has been available to the patients uh, for the last seven, eight years. So now we've blended in so well that people tend to forget that we are part of the community there. To support the patients, we work closely with uh, our hardworking colleagues in the emergency department. And uh, our main goal is to um, assess patients who are medically fit to prevent unnecessary admissions to hospital. So we may provide uh, some equipment or arrange a care package directly from, uh, from A&E. And more often than not, we would also refer patients, our patients in, uh, in, uh, to the community. And sometimes, sometimes our role is, uh, is just advisory. So we may, uh, we may provide leaflets and information about our services in the community. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, that's all our patients need. Maybe information about pendant alarms, key safes, uh, uh, or other services available. Sometimes uh, we feel it's um, within our role and it's just our duty as well to flag up concerns 
regarding a discharge. So uh, the purpose of our our assessments is is obviously to to decide if a patient, together with with the patient and uh, relatives and carers, to decide whether the pa patient is actually safe to be discharged uh, home. That's a really good point, isn't it? I mean, safeguarding must come into that as well. Like, you must have to have such a holistic view of the patient. You must have to have so much information about what they're going through and the carers and the parents and the, the family support network they've got at home. Do you find that quite challenging, that you have to have so much information? And do you always get as much information as you need? Yeah, so I do find it's, it's a little bit, uh, our role uh, involves a little bit of a detective work yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Uh, I personally enjoy very much uh, uh, looking out for all this information and uh, the benefit of uh, being part of the community is that we have access to information in the community to system one. So that's where the majority of information comes from. Uh, but then we use our skills to integrate information com coming from a variety of uh, sources. So. Of course, we use information from the paramedics, from the carers, and ultimately, of course, uh, from the patient and also from the medical team that, uh, that sees the patient. So uh, they they would be able to advise us uh, what's the latest uh, development from medical point of view. So uh, that, of course, influences our decision. And I just wanted to mention, uh, to, to give a special mention to, uh, of the OPET team, which is uh, uh, the Older Persons Emergency Department team, uh, which is a dedicated team of clinicians who are based in the emergency department. And uh, they work so hard that uh, uh, to ensure that our elderly patients receive the best possible care um, in uh, the emergency department. So. Uh, uh, we are very, very fortunate to work with them. So, and we work so well together uh, to prevent uh, this uh, unnecessary admissions uh, to hospital. There's an abundance of, uh, of evidence in literature with regards to the hospital associated deconditioning or deconditioning syndrome, if you want to call it like that, which leads to a functional decline and poor outcomes for these patients. So, the general public should be a little bit more aware and maybe perhaps a little bit more educated of the risks for their loved ones when they are admitted to hospital. And that's in no way a reflection on, on the care that they're receiving uh, on the wards. I, we, we know that the staff on the wards work very hard. It's just it's very difficult uh, for an elderly population that has uh, limited reserves to maintain their uh, functional level and to be able to always successfully uh, discharge uh, this uh, this patient in the same in the same condition following a, a hospital admission so in this context i find that our role is even more vital to prevent uh, this uh, unnecessary admissions altogether and uh, i'm personally so so proud of our team uh, working so hard to provide the best service for our community with compassion and creativity you're absolutely right. I think most of us would want to be at home if we're not feeling well. But, you know, the, the older population, is there's, there's a lot of routine involved. There's a lot of home comforts, just feeling comfortable and feeling safe. And I think you're right, regardless of the amazing job that the staff do, you're never going to feel quite as at home as if you're actually at home. So the work that you do is amazing to get people back home and, and comfortable, but you do have to be safe with that as well. And it has to be the right decision. So I suppose it must be quite tricky to then feed back to a patient when they do have to have a hospital stay to say yeah. actually no you can't go home and you know is that quite a challenging conversation to have sometimes it can be yes our goal is for for our team to actually discharge the patient so we're actually going against our our purpose so we do explain we never keep anybody against our, their will so in very very extraordinary circumstances we do have to go ahead with the discharge if the patient wishes to do so but in uh, in my experience of working here it, it's just something that happens very very rarely and patients do understand actually that uh, we we do mean well for them because we have got the two aspects of our team if someone is in A&E and they're deemed medically fit for discharge, but functionally they're just not able to manage their normal activities, even with support and equipment at home, we have the opportunity, if there is beds available, to provide them with a community bed. So it does prevent the acute admission from happening, but it gets them to a safe place so they can 
optimise from where they have maybe deconditioned prior to admission or their injury is preventing them. They've got to learn a new technique on how they can function at home. And that's what we have. That is a very unique thing that we have that we can access those beds as well, because that's part of our whole team is, is supporting that bed based management at the back door, as we call it as well. That's so interesting because the collaboration with the patient that you have to do in terms of what is best for their safety and their needs, you also have that collaboration with the carers and the parents and the family network. But then you have the extended collaboration of between community and acute. And interestingly, you're not based at community, are you? Tell me a bit more about that. Where are you based? We are based in an acute hospital at the moment and the majority of our caseload is completed within the acute hospital. The front door service, A&E service, is um, the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital and when patients have been deemed medically safe for discharge they get referred to our team. We also will try to source patients as well to make sure that, that we're sort of beginning to see the patients that will potentially trickle through to our caseload just so we can start thinking about how can we how can we make this um, work a little better for them how can we improve the timely manner that a referral comes into and I know that the perception may be for a patient who's actually sat here for a long long while with a very busy department whether it be our department the A&E department or the ward-based departments it can feel a really, really long, laborious journey for them, especially if they're not feeling clinically well. And I do want that assurance out there that we, we try to jump in as quick as possible within the resource we have and within the sort of stuff we can access. And I think that is one of the sort of clearest things within A&E that we're really improving on. But we want to make sure that we support our system colleagues because we need to make sure they're confident that a person's ready for discharge as well. We don't want to be telling them that they're ready for discharge. We want to listen to them when they feel they're ready for discharge. So does it help then being in the acute environment with those conversations needing to happen? Does it help that you're kind of on the ground? Certainly, certainly. Well, uh, it just may sound a bit uh, strange that we are, com we are community staff and we are based in the acute hospital. I think it's a it's a great benefit. It's a great benefit to have uh, to to have eyes on side because uh, one of my passions actually is to ensure that uh, the transition back home, back into the community, is as smooth as possible. And uh, by having System One, for me personally and for us, uh, it's not uh, it's not just about having access to information. It's about giving feedback and giving back information to the to the community staff uh, it's not just uh, our community but some gps have access uh, use system one so we we document on system one and i think that's really really important for the patient care really that the information uh, is there the information we do gather if unfortunately someone isn't clinically well enough to go home at that point it's the good starting point for the rest of the way through the hospital and if they do come through on our pathway, you know, we're not overlapping and trying to start something totally again. We've got all that information there to be able to support a, a discharge into one of our community hospitals as well. So we, we have it both ways, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And also uh, just looking uh, looking at particular like patients who uh, are coming from a community and uh, let's say there are lots of services, uh, community services that have been involved with this patient. Uh, let's say the patient is admitted to hospital. We will do our best to um, maybe um, print off some of these notes uh, to make, make the therapists aware on the wards that these notes mm. exist, this extra source of information information exists in the patient notes, uh, again, for the benefit of the patient and to make sure that the transition from the community into acute care is as best as possible. Well, absolutely. And we want the patients to only have to tell their story as, yeah. well, as little as they have to. The whole point of being part of an ICS, the integrated care system, is that we have this collaboration. So in terms of, you, you mentioned GPs, but do you get involved with sort of social services and, um, and other trusts like NSFT for mental health? Like, Do you have those kind of collaborations outside of the NNN as well? To support people to get home, we're able to make referrals for them on the social service portal. 
We also have access to um, other teams in the community that are able to provide sort of some short term assessments and care. We have voluntary services as well that we access, which can also support a very, very uh, big aspect of discharge. We've got the Red Cross that will help with settling somebody back in their own home if they were returning home alone when relatives live away. I think that's one of the, the, the sort of common findings we have is talking to relatives on the phone, but actually finding they don't live locally. And they're so worried about their relative being returned home. Some people see an acute hospital as a really positive thing to be admitted because they feel, oh, oh, they're safe now, they're OK. The message that again we would like to reiterate is is home first is definitely definitely the best thing that we, we would like to happen and if that can't happen we will facilitate all around the best things possible but we we use our voluntary services we've got district direct haven't we which is a, another service that um, supports people that maybe they don't have that much at home or they've come into a and e with um various different bits of clothes missing because of their acute event and then they'll support them maybe getting some more clothes on or they'll support them getting home or what do they need to get home so the voluntary sector is a real big aspect to it all as well. That's fascinating because you don't think about that you go into the emergency department with an emergency and you have probably dropped everything to go there you might not even have a coat or you know or some shoes on and things like that that's such an interesting perspective and you're right if you've got a family member who can bring that to you then great but a lot of people don't so to have I, I guess it must feel to a lot of patients that your team and the services that you can draw on are really a kind of a crutch and a and a nice warm hug in a way it sounds like something that is so vital to the services that we offer well, yes, yeah, we do um, try our best to to support these patients and not to forget that uh, they are human beings. And uh, I think our team in a very, very busy, busy department, we we do make an effort to put an arm around uh, somebody's shoulder. So, for example, um, maybe about a month ago, I had a patient who has been on, on the floor for maybe about 10 hours uh, due to, I don't know, delays in him pressing pressing his pendant alarm, but also delays in the, the ambulance responding to him. He was so upset by the time he got to the hospital. And uh, while he was talking to me, I just I just said, oh, would you like a hug? Or do you think a hug would help? And she said, oh, yes, please. And, uh, you know, sometimes some sometimes gestures like this can make a difference or for the same for the same gentleman. He was really worried that he's about his cat. So mm. I think I mean, things like calling the carers and make sh making sure that that they somebody looks after this cat would would mean it's you may think is a, is a small gesture, but that actually it makes a difference for this patient. Contacting the relatives when they've been in the acute hospital for sometimes quite a long period of time. They're really pleased to just have some feedback about where they are and in their discharge journey at that time. I think what, what the best thing is, is, is they, they then know that the next part has started. But we also give clarification that by the time the community bed becomes available, they may have optimised in the acute hospital and may be ready for discharge from the acute. So that's probably the only thing that is a bit sort of sad about the process is that there's probably not enough community beds for people at times, which. Um... No, but I guess in a way, though, as a, as a family member or a carer, even as the patient, you're just glad that the journey has started, that you're on your way, yeah. that even if you're not able to get to a community bed, by the time you are optimised and you're able to get home, at least you know that something is, the wheels are in motion, basically. Yeah. So that must be really, yeah, that must be lovely for people to hear. We have talked about some of the challenges of your role and we've also talked about some of the real positives and benefits to the patient and some of the kind of lovely stuff. But what are some of the real biggest challenges that you face in the community access team? We as, as a whole team, we can get quite saddened by how many we have on our caseload, how thinly I suppose we have to spread ourselves. That's that's the real key thing. We have to really spread ourselves thinly but we really are focused on making sure we give a good quality outcome. But unfortunately, at times we might have to just be aware of our limitations within the resource we've got. And I think on a positive aspect, we, we have to, 
I think as a team, we focus on what we can do. That is our ethos. We, we focus on what we can achieve, what we can do for that patient, for that relative. There's a lot to be said for really listening and hearing what someone is saying and even just hearing that, that I want to make sure my cat is fed. I think that is such a huge thing. You don't just dismiss what someone is saying and thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm more focused on your health because actually that is it's a holistic view of the patient that that's what's important to them. And that's what's going to make you recover more quickly is if you know that aspects of your life at home are sorted out, it's going to help you focus on your recovery. So it may seem like a small thing to some people, but listening and collaborating with the patient and the other services is really just enormous. When a person presents to A&E, they're at a real critical time in their life or their day at that stage. And when a patient is actually admitted into the wards, A&E and ward staff, they have to focus on getting what they need to get done that day to make sure while they're managing all their patients that they have to get done, everyone in A&E getting them through in a timely, safe manner. And I think we're, we are a team that, I mean, we wrap around all that and we we listen and we can see the challenges they have. Well, if we can relieve some of our colleagues with them challenges, but also focusing on what we can do to make sure that patient is okay. And I, I genuinely think that's probably what our team does best. If we can get people home, the relief they feel when, when you've actually managed to support them in a safe way, it's a temporary change that we do to support them or it's the beginning of maybe a, a, a long-term change, but it gives them a chance to get used to it within their home environment. And when they come into the hospital, again, it's a it's a chance for us to review everything and make sure that we, we can support how they get back to some form of a good quality of life. Thank you for listening to Take a Moment with NCHC. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please visit the podcast intranet page to leave a comment and for details of our other episodes. You can also follow NCHC on all social media channels.